Welcome to Designs for Sharpening Leadership. Today we're going to devote an exclusive time to one person in the Old Testament, and that man's name is Moses. He is the man that will influence the nation of Israel from about uh, 1500 BC, and his influence is still being felt today, not only in Israel, but all over the world because he was uh, the giver of the law. And that's important for us to remember that Moses was the man who was the giver of the law. And we know about the law because it is written in a group of books known as the Pentateuch. You might hear people refer to the Pentateuch meaning five books, and those books are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses is the author of all five of those books. Now, when we think about Moses, remember I said before that Moses or that people have relationships. And so we always gather people around us. And we want to remember that in these relationships that God is always uh, bringing his people back to himself through Jesus Christ. And what he's doing here with Moses is he is preparing the kingdom to bring forth the Christ child in order that the, the church might become a reality and that we might be saved from our sins. One man in particular, that Moses is uh, going to have accompany him is a man that uh, uh, we're all very familiar with, a man by the name of Pharaoh. And of course, the Pharaohs were the kings of Egypt. And the scripture says in Exodus chapter 1 that there arose a king in Egypt, a Pharaoh in Egypt, who did not know Moses, that was a, a previous generation, had died away, and now new leadership was needed in the kingdom of God as he began to prepare to bring back his people to himself through Jesus Christ. We want to begin with what was actually going on uh, surrounding Moses' birth, because it's important to understand that the Hebrew nation was growing they went down into Egypt with about 75 people, and, and now they're, they're close to a million people. So the, the Egyptians are quite fearful of the uh, Hebrew people. As a result of that, the Pharaoh will say, when a male child is born, I want you to kill him. There were a couple of righteous people in the Old Testament that uh, became the parents of Moses, a man by the name of Aram and his wife, Jochebed. They had a son whose name was Moses, but prior to, the, to that, they had uh, two other children. They had a son whose name is Aaron and a daughter whose name was Miriam. Aaron was about three years older than, uh, than Moses. And when Moses was born, because he was supposed to to die because that was the decree. Uh, he would he, he was hidden for three months until he finally became too too big to hide any longer. You could only hide a baby for so so long. What they did is they they built a wicker basket, uh, put pitch inside, pitch on the outside, put it in the Nile River, and stood back to see what God would do. Pharaoh's daughter came down to take her her morning bath. Found the the uh, the basket there with the baby crying in it, understood that this was one of the Hebrew children, and immediately took the baby into her care, into her home. And so Miriam, the sister of Moses, runs up to Pharaoh's daughter and said, listen, I'll, I'll get you a wet nurse, and, and that woman will take care of this baby for you. And so that is exactly what happened. Miriam ran, got her mother, and Jochebed was able to care for her child, in the palace of Pharaoh. God was in control. And so we have Moses being born to Aram and Jochebed. And he, his name literally means drawn out of. So he was drawn out of the water. He was spared. And he was taken into the house of Pharaoh and cared for by his own mother. So we have the, the family of Moses, uh, Aram and Jochebed, we don't hear anything more about them. We hear about Aaron and Miriam as they, uh, as they are involved in Moses' life. And then we see Moses being trained 
in the laws and the customs of Egypt. In fact, Acts chapter 7 verse 22 says that Moses was a man of power in words and deeds. Now, even though Moses was raised in the house of Pharaoh, he chose to reject the pleasures of Egypt for the people of God. We read about this in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 24 and 25. When Moses began to be about the age of 40 years old, he saw one of the slave masters beating one of the Hebrew children. So he, he tried to uh, intervene and he ended up killing the slave master. The, the next day, he, he found two of the Hebrew children fighting together and he intervened and one said, uh, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And he knew that he had been found out. And so he flees from Egypt and he goes to the desert of Midian. Midian. And there he lives for another 40 years. While he's in Midian, he marries a woman whose name is Zipporah. Zipporah. And they have two children. They have a son whose name is Gershom. And his name means alien. And they have another son whose name is Eli Eliezer. And his name is uh, God is my help. God is my help. You see, he has not forgotten God. He's out there in the wilderness. He knows about God because his mother taught him about God from uh, from the beginning years of his life. Oh, by the way, Zipporah's father is an important character that Moses will deal with the rest of his life. And this man's name is Jethro. Now, the scripture says that Jethro was the priest of Midian. We really don't know what that means, but we do know this. We know that Moses taught Jethro about God. It was not the other way around. When we look at Moses' life, we realize that there are three distinct periods in his life, is that all of these periods have about the same period of time. There was the uh, 40 years in Egypt, growing up, there was 40 years in the desert of Midian. And in a little bit, we'll look at another 40 years where he is in the wilderness, leading the people of Israel out of Egypt and to the promised land. 40, 40, 40. If someone asks you, how many years did Moses live? Uh, of course, you should be able to say, well, he lived 120 years. And his life is easily divided between Egypt, Midian, and leading the people out of the land uh, into the wilderness. But Moses is called by God in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. It would be a very good idea for you to go back and read the entire book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 3, we see Moses being called by God, and he meets God out at Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb. And there God appears to him in a burning bush that is not consumed. Now this troubled Moses. He he stopped. He said, I, I think I'll stop and see what's going on here because this bush should be consumed. And God begins to speak to Moses. God says, Moses, take off your shoes for you're now walking on holy ground. Moses is called by God to go back into Egypt and to take the people of Israel out of Egypt. Immediately, Moses does what most of us do when we face a challenge. And that is that we begin to give God all kinds of excuses. He says, well, who am I? that I should go back and and rescue the people of Israel. Not only does he say that, but he says, well, what should I tell them 
about your name. Who are you that is sending me? And how will they recognize that you are God? And third excuse, he says, what if they do not believe me? Furthermore, he said, I'm not an eloquent speaker. I'm slow of speech. I find that interesting in light of the fact that in Acts chapter 7, the scripture says that he was a powerful man in word and in deeds. And finally, Moses just throws his hands up and he says, God, you got the wrong guy. Send somebody else. All of us who have grown up, become leaders, have faced temptations like this at one time or another. We give God excuses for why we can't do the job. And finally, God says, listen, you are going, and this is my name. My name is I am who I am. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. I am the everlasting one. And so we have uh, the name of God being given to Moses. His name is, let's see if we can get enough room here to do this. His name is Yahweh. My name is God, the everlasting one. I am the Lord. And it, it comes from the Hebrew verb to be. I am, always was, I am, and I always will be. This is my memorial name. This is the name that you need to to deal with me. This is the covenant-keeping God, okay? And so Moses is empowered in Exodus chapter 4. Moses returns to Egypt. There's only one problem. When he gets back to Egypt, nobody listens to him. Sinners, the, the people that are rebellious, they don't listen to him. The people, the chosen people of God, they don't listen to him. And Pharaoh certainly doesn't listen to him. So what's a man to do? Moses begins to interact with Pharaoh, and he he challenges Pharaoh. He challenges Pharaoh's power, and he begins to demonstrate God's power. And so what he does is there's what I would say is a, a, a great wrestling match between God and Pharaoh. And, and the more Pharaoh wrestles with God, the more uh, he refuses to listen to God, and the more God begins to to harden Pharaoh's heart. There are 10 plagues that, that uh, Moses brought on the nation of Egypt. Very first pl plague was that he turned the rivers, the water, to blood. And then he brought frogs upon the land until there were frogs all over the place and they, they died and piled them up and the land just, it was just a bad place to live. And then uh, that wasn't enough. Pharaoh said, I'll, I'll let your people go, but only this far. And, and there were stipulations put on it. Moses said, no, the, the people are going to go. And Pharaoh said, no, they're not going to do it your way. They're going to do it my way. And so God says, okay, no, no problem. And so God brings lice upon the land, a third plague. And, and the people are going crazy with all of this. And, and that isn't enough. Uh, Pharaoh still hardens his heart. And so God says, well, let's give you a a dose of flies, and and the flies came in and infested the, the land, and then then things really took a turn for the worse because there was the death of the livestock. God begins to hit people where it hurts, their pocketbook, because people were uh, needing food, people were raising cattle and selling cattle. And using that uh, uh, those cattle to uh, to uh, worship their gods, and God says, "Let me show you who the real God is." That wasn't enough because Pharaoh said, "No, I'm not going to let your people go." And so God then brings boils on people. Boils are are like great big sores all over your body, uh, and so the people were uh, hurting because of what God uh, had done. That wasn't enough. Pharaoh said, no, I'm not going to let your people go. And so God brings hail on the land. And now the hail begins to destroy the plants, the harvest, uh, everything that uh, the people had for food. The hail was now destroying. That wasn't enough. Pharaoh said, I'm not going to let your people go. And so God then brings the locusts upon 
the land, and the locusts come in and eat everything, everything that the hail didn't strip off, the locusts came in and ate. And then God brings an interesting dilemma upon the, line, the land, and that is darkness. Darkness. Now, one time I was able to go to, to a cave out in South Dakota known as Jewel Cave. My friend Mike Wiles was the, the leader on this uh, splunking tour, and he got us way down into the bottom of the cave, and all the lights went off. Total pitch darkness. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. You, you couldn't see where to take a step because you might fall further down inside the cave. I think that's the kind of the darkness that God brought on the nation of, of Egypt. He was trying to show them that he is light and they were rebelling against him. There's one final plague that Moses brought on the land of Egypt because God instructed him to, and that was the death. There we go, the death of the firstborn. All throughout the land, the firstborn died from human to the cattle that were in the barns dead, gone. And it wasn't until this that Pharaoh finally said, take your people and go. Over in Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, the scripture says that each of these plagues was a judgment upon the gods of Egypt. And so while God was taking the people out of Egypt, he was also demonstrating to Pharaoh that your gods are powerless before me. Your gods cannot do anything. I am the God of the universe, and you need to be aware of that. And so Moses will now take the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and he will take them to the promised land. And so now they're leaving the land of Egypt. Let's move our blackboard over here just a little bit. So, so Moses takes the people out of Egypt, and as they are leaving Egypt, he instructs them to celebrate a feast called the Passover. And this is where the death angel passed over the homes of those Hebrews who had the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. They were supposed to eat lamb. They were supposed to eat unleavened bread. They were supposed to eat uh, bitter herbs. They were supposed to do these things so that they would remember that God brought them out of the land of Egypt. We remember as Christians that God brought us out of a sinful life when we come around the Lord's table and we partake of the Lord's Supper. So Passover was the time when God passed over the nation of Israel and struck the nation of Egypt, destroying their firstborn. Moses takes the people out of the land of Egypt and takes them into the wilderness. And the very first obstacle that they come across is the, uh, is the Red Sea. And the people begin to whine and moan and cry just like some of us do. They said, what are we going to do here, Moses? We have the Red Sea in front of us. And God said, have the people stand back and trust me. A division came in the middle of the Red Sea and the nation of Israel marched through the middle of the Red Sea and the nation of Egypt tried to come after them. God destroyed them, bringing the water down upon them and destroying them from the beginning to the end. Now Moses has the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt across the Red Sea and in the wilderness. And what do the people do? The people complain and complain and complain because nothing is ever really good enough. And here is what Moses did. He turned to God. He prayed to God. 
He said, God, I don't know what to do with these people. They're not my people. They're your people. You you sent me. I, I've done what you wanted me to do. Now you take care of them. They they wanted water to drink. They wanted meat to eat. They wanted bread to eat. I mean, what do you do with a million people out there in the mid, in, in the middle of the wilderness? There's not a McDonald's. There's not a, a Burger King. There's there's not a Red Lobster. There, there's nothing out there, nothing whatsoever. And so God gave them a rock, and God said to Moses, strike the rock, and water will come out. God sent them quail from the sea and, and fed them with quail, and God, God gave them manna, uh, to feed them uh, as, as though it were bread. It was a type of bread. And so the people were taken care of, and yet they complained. In Exodus chapter 17, Moses faces the Amalekites. Now, here's the people that have been secure all of their lives in the land of Egypt, except that they're slaves there, and they keep forgetting that. And now they come out, and they have to face the Amalekites. Amalekites. Kites. Let's see if we have that word spelled right there. Okay. And this is where a man begins to come forward that we're going to see later on in the history of the nation of Israel. And that man's name is Joshua. So Moses appoints Joshua. Joshua becomes the man that goes out and he is the man that defeats the Amalekites. Something else that Moses learned as he was taking the people to the uh, uh, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, he learned how to delegate. One of the things we learn as leaders is that we can't do everything ourselves. We can't be the lone ranger, so to speak. And so he led them to Mount Sinai, and that's an important place to remember. And we'll talk about that in another Lesson Mount Sinai. Let's see if we can make that an N there. Mount Sinai. And there at Mount Sinai, the people received the law and they built the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a lesson all in itself. It was the place where God was worshipped. And we'll talk about that uh, totally in a in another lesson because we'll need an entire lesson just to, to talk about the tabernacle. And so they're at the mountain uh, and he had to put up with the people while they uh, led their sinful uh, lives at the mountain. Uh, they, they thought that Moses was dead. They were going to get another leader. They were going to make their own gods. And, and they just totally rebelled. Finally, Moses come down from the mountain. And after building the tabernacle, after staying at the mountain for about 11 months, he leads them to a city known as Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea. And here he sends 12 spies in to spy out the land of Canaan, 12 spies. And there were among these spies, again, that name that we saw earlier, a man by the name of Joshua and another man by the name of Caleb. Both these men were righteous men who trusted in God. They thought that Israel could take the land. The 10 other spies thought that Israel could not take the land. And so they brought back a bad report about the land. They turned the nation of Israel against God. And so God said, okay, if you want to act that way, you can wander in the wilderness and tell all of these people that rebelled against me die. You catch that? God was willing to lead them. God was willing to extend to them grace and mercy. But when they rejected his grace and mercy, there was God's wrath. And so the people wandered in the wilderness for 38 years until that generation of men died. However, there were two men that did not die. And their names are Joshua and Caleb. Of those that were 20 years and older, Joshua and Caleb were the only two who came out of Egypt and also entered into the promised land. As they're wandering around in the wilderness, what's going on? Well, the people, again, are still rebelling. There are conflicts all the time. There was a couple of priests that thought they would do things their way. You know, I'll have it my way. I'll do my own thing. I'm the captain of my own ship. I'm the master of my destiny. A couple of priests said, uh, no, thank you, God. We'll do things our way. 
and their names were Nadab and Abihu. God said, listen, there's a certain kind of a fire I want you to use when you uh, make sacrifices. And Nadab and Abihu said, well, we think uh, we'll, we'll use our own fire, God, uh, but uh, thanks for the advice. And God said, no, that's not advice. This is the way I want things done. Consequently, the fire came out and consumed these two men because they didn't do things God's way. God knew what was right. These men thought they did. People challenged the authority of Moses. His own sister Miriam even challenged his authority, challenged his right to be the one in charge. People challenged the uh, right of Aaron to be the high priest of the people. Uh, people just continued to sin. And at one point in Numbers chapter 20, Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13, the people are complaining again and again and again. Give us water. Give us water. Give. And in this passage, God says to Moses, go to the rock and speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. Moses came before the throne, uh, came before the crowd, and he had his, uh, he had his walking stick with him. And he begins to speak to the crowd and preach to the crowd, and, and he becomes angry with the crowd, and instead of speaking to the rock, he strikes the rock. And instead of giving God the glory for the water, he takes the glory to himself. He's, he's had it with these people. You can understand where he's coming from, can't you? And God says, Moses, I love you, but you disobeyed me also. You will not enter the land of Canaan. You will not enter the land of Canaan because of your sin. And so the last record that we have of Moses is in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 34. Moses goes to Mount Nebo, and there God shows him the splendor of the promised land, everything from beginning to end, and then Moses dies. I find that interesting. I find that interesting because here was a man that was a leader that obeyed God, a man after God's own heart, and yet he failed God in a very important task, and God said, you cannot enter the promised land. Now, did that mean that God did not love him? No, not, a, not at all. God still loved him. It's just that when we sin, there are consequences. That's an important lesson for all of us to, to learn, that when we sin, sin always yields consequences. And although Moses was a great leader, he also had to pay the consequences for his sin. I'd like to leave you with one final passage of scripture. Our goal in these studies is to give people information about the Word of God and the importance of the Word of God, hoping that people will take the Word of God into their lives and their lives will be changed. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 is the passage of scripture that I want to share with you today. And there the writer of Hebrews says this, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. When God told Moses that he could not go into the promised land, I'm sure it broke his heart. And yet God's word judged Moses because Moses failed to do what God commanded him to do. God loved Moses. God extended grace and mercy to Moses. I believe that when we go to heaven, we'll see Moses. But the temporary consequence was that he would not enter into the promised land. I would pray today that as you study God's word, that you will not fail to enter into the blessings that God has given you. You have a great day. Bye.